The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of KSMQ Public Service Media Incorporated or its assigns. This program sponsored in part by Austin Windshield Plus, your local windshield experts. Speedy Insurance approved auto glass replacement or repair. Mobile or in-shop quality service, 100% satisfaction guaranteed. We're standing outside the newly constructed KSMQ Broadcast Center in downtown Austin, Minnesota, where we've made our home since fall of 2022. After a long Minnesota winter spent mostly inside, with spring's welcomed arrival, we soon discovered a very interesting guest growing in the landscape of our new digs. A random wild plant we've come to know affectionately as Audrey in reference to the 1986 movie and cult classic, Little Shop of Horrors. But our Audrey had one distinct characteristic. Come to find out, she's actually a cannabis plant. Fast forward to August and Audrey grew an alarming 12 feet tall with a base as thick as a corn stalk. Collectively, questions emerged as we grew concerned about Audrey's legal status. For starters, is Audrey a marijuana plant or just a hemp plant? Is aiding and abetting a supersized cannabis shrub for the summer perhaps still a crime, even if we never actually planted it? What if Audrey actually took root before August 1st? That's when we realized we couldn't possibly be the only ones struggling to navigate the murky waters of Minnesota's recent and historic recreational marijuana legislation. And perhaps it was high time someone shed a little growing light on the situation. On August 1st, recreational marijuana use became legal in Minnesota. But what does that actually mean? KSMQ takes a look at what the law truly allows and doesn't. Cannabis Connections was produced locally by KSMQ. Welcome to KSMQ's Cannabis Connections, a locally produced in-depth one-hour documentary focusing on the legal, cultural, and public safety dynamics of this complicated new Minnesota recreational marijuana legislation. I'm your host, Dan Ehrlich, and I've spent several interesting weeks meeting with legislators, law enforcement officials, users, growers, even marijuana dealers asking the hard questions to cultivate the most comprehensive and diverse report possible. Honey. Regardless of where you stand on this issue, I'm confident you'll enjoy this, at times serious, other times humorous, but always compelling account of a historic moment in Minnesota history. Innocent of a new and deadly menace lurking behind closed doors. Marijuana the burning weed with its roots in hell. In 1937, fueled in part by the campy 1936 marijuana propaganda film, Reefer Madness, Try one of these. and fears of a Mexican immigrant pro-marijuana culture perceived to be taking root in the United States, the Marijuana Tax Act was passed, officially banning the divisive plant at the federal level. But much like the contemporary undoing of marijuana prohibition, Many states had already restricted usage ahead of the federal ban. Have you been smoking marijuana? Marijuana is illegal, I know that. That's right. For now. In a couple of years, things may change when all the kids grow up and start wearing ties and going to the polls. Marijuana is going to be like liquor, packaged and taxed and sold right off the shelf. I doubt it, Mr. Shipley. Since then, America's relationship with marijuana has vacillated between love and hate, depending on who you ask and when. By the 1950s, a pro-marijuana beatnik counterculture was surfacing on the California scene, introducing a more liberal view of all drugs. Hipsters traded the sullied name of reefer in for the modern slang weed or pot. By the 60s, the movement had spread through the country and illicit drugs of all kinds were being distributed and used in America, eventually even permeating the military where over half of Vietnam War veterans reported having used cannabis or other illicit drugs in combat. You get really stoned. Then, you know, who like who cares about the war? <laughs> so I got some uh, store bought right over here. Despite being illegal, throughout the 70s, marijuana played a significant role in American culture. You mean marijuana? 
with musicians, comedians, and actors often referencing weed in songs, stand up, and movies. And then there are your friends who smoke marijuana going, John, man, alcohol's a crutch. <laughs> the weather is dominated by a large Canadian low, which is not to be confused with a Mexican high. <laughs> hey, man, am I driving okay? I think we're parked, man. Yeah. Don't you know that we're a sitting downtown in a railway station, one talk. One joke over the line. Have you heard a modern spiritual by Gale and Dale? It's yours? No, I must have said she found it in your closet. The 1980s brought about the war on drugs, which in hindsight is widely seen as completely ineffective at curbing America's desire to get high succeeding instead at spiking jail and prison populations with nonviolent marijuana charges. This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? I get angry just thinking about it, it makes me mad. Little kids doing drugs, it turns my stomach. <laughs> Many of you may be thinking, well, drugs don't concern me, but it does concern you. The Just Say No campaign launched by Nancy Reagan is now believed by many to have been a gross oversimplification of drug addiction. Marijuana's role in contemporary culture is either part of the problem or part of the solution, again, depending on who you ask. Some kids think smoking weed makes you cool. What about those who think you already are? I'm going to try meth just once. Some are convinced marijuana is the gateway drug that leads to all other illicit once. drug use. Marijuana proponents would argue once. that those susceptible to drug addiction will find their way there eventually, no matter what and that marijuana doesn't make anyone more or less likely to experience addiction. In fact, some studies suggest marijuana may be a healthy treatment alternative for those struggling with drug addiction. But because it's always been considered a Schedule One drug by the federal government, conclusive studies are still hard to come by. In 2014, lawmakers voted to legalize medical use marijuana in Minnesota for a limited number of qualifying conditions slowly adding more diagnosis over time. In July of 2022, in a move that caught many stakeholders by surprise, low-level THC products were legalized. These products were distributed by licensed dispensaries, mostly in the form of infused gummies and beverages. In spring of 2023, the Minnesota House and Senate voted to fully legalize marijuana for recreational use. However, THC remains illegal at the federal level. Just a few more minutes, uh, we are going to vote uh, for the last time to legalize uh, cannabis here in the House chamber, and that vote will pass, as many people on both sides have said. The clerk will take the roll on the bill. Regardless of where you stand, recreational use marijuana is now legal in Minnesota. Marijuana users are no longer beholden to illicit purchases in dark alleyways, sketchy city parks, or a dealer's dank apartment. So it's August 1st, 2023 in uh, Minnesota. What are you up to today? Uh, just hanging out, just ro roasting a bone, you know. Yep. Here to you know, do some good consumption with friends and just enjoy the environment and enjoy the people. Just being law-abiding citizens. <laughs> Minnesota pot smokers are coming out of the basement, but that doesn't mean you can just walk down to your local dispensary to make a pot purchase, step outside and start smoking. In fact, retail sales won't even be rolled out until 2025. In the meantime, with guidelines from the state being unclear or incomplete, 
additional pressure is placed on the cities and local law enforcement to fill the gaps. Moving on to our public hearings, which I know a lot of you here in the audience are eager for. With the state's blessing, many cities have opted to ban new cannabis businesses altogether until 2025 to buy time to navigate the uncharted waters. Unknowns like number of dispensaries, hours of operation, and restricted areas of usage have all been left on the table for municipalities to hammer out. For now, the only place to purchase marijuana in Minnesota until 2025 is from one of two dispensaries, Virio Health, also known as Green Goods, and Rise Dispensaries. Both currently hold licenses to sell THC products in Minnesota to those with one or more qualifying medical conditions. Some local CBD shop owners and farmers feel this squeezes them out while giving favor to these two large national companies establishing a customer base in the interim at their expense. One other option for wannabe early users is to purchase from marijuana dispensaries on tribal lands, of which there are also only two, both located in northern Minnesota, hours from the metro. A final option for those with gardening skills and a desire to smoke sooner is to grow their own plants. The new law allows for individuals over 21 years of age to possess up to eight plants, four mature and four germinating. On average, each plant will produce one pound of usable marijuana. Adults may keep up to two pounds in their home or two ounces on their person at any given time. This was negotiated back from five pounds in the original bill, which many felt was excessive. Here we go. Sorry, I'm missing one more. HF100, Minnesota's comprehensive marijuana legalization bill, includes over 300 pages of detail. Let's review a highly condensed summary. Individuals may possess up to two pounds of marijuana in their homes and two ounces on their person. They may also share up to two ounces with other adults. Most low-level marijuana charges will be automatically expunged from criminal records. Retail sales of marijuana may not begin until 2025. While local governments may regulate dispensaries, they cannot prohibit them from operating. An additional 10% tax will be placed on all cannabis products. The revenue will be split 80-20 between the state and local governments. These funds will mostly be applied to prevention, outreach, education, and data collection programs. An Office of Cannabis Management will be established to regulate the new industry. Those with prior criminal records related to marijuana charges will be given preferential status for dispensary licensing. It's really frustrating that, uh, and it's hard for you to stand alone, but as legislators sometimes we have to do that. And it was unfortunate that uh, a couple of those that I know they had heartburn voting for that bill. Because we can see as Republicans, I could see that it was coming. And I didn't like the approach the first two years that we just ignored it. I think we needed to be in the conversation and we, I think we blew it there. If they would have just passed it and had at least waited till next year is one thing. Yeah. Uh, and I think everybody's seeing that it wasn't ready for prime time. Uh, and we just came out, what, a week or two ago that, uh, that you can smoke in public in the, in the parks and on the street. And when we went through the bill, that wasn't our understanding. Uh, 331 pages, I think it is. Um, you know, there's a lot of jokes about how thick the legislation was. I think it was over 400 pages by the end of it. And that's because we thought about so many things. Um, we talked about, uh, people were concerned about uppages of DUIs and how do you spot that without a breathalyzer test. Uh, we gave $14 million to local law enforcement so that they could have specific training uh, to help recognize uh, those behaviors that might show driving under the influence of marijuana. Um, people were concerned about how was it going to be uh, given to children or in some ways, you know, uh, marketed to children. And we specifically did very um, explicit guidelines of how that couldn't happen. Actually, with me being a little bit more libertarian leaning, I wasn't necessarily opposed. 
I just wanted to make sure that our local municipalities and that our law enforcement had a little bit more tools so that they were able to control the way that they wanted to in their own, in their own cities. And in my opinion, like I said, I think it just came a little bit too quickly uh, without really doing due diligence to make sure that like alcohol, like tobacco, we have a regulatory framework set up. In 1998, the independent grassroots party was formed with a specific goal of legalizing marijuana in Minnesota. Over the decades, the organization morphed into two parties and, in recent years, started siphoning votes from the two majors by running single-issue candidates in various elections. Some speculate that, perhaps fed up with losing votes in tight races, the Democratic Party decided to take up the cause with vigor in the 2023 work session, ultimately passing HF 100. Do you believe the grassroots legal cannabis or the legal marijuana now parties were able to influence election outcomes? Uh, well, they were like five or six percent. So yeah, sure, I would say yes. Bill Rude from the grassroots legalized cannabis party ran for the Senate seat in Olmstead County District 25, receiving 2.1% of the vote. Not enough to sway the election toward either of the major parties, but other races featuring independent candidates in the mix finished much closer. Okay, I'm running for Minnesota Senate so that voters have a real choice. I'm not looking to steal votes from Ken or from Liz. I'm providing an alternative for those uh, who don't want to the vote for the lesser evil and who would otherwise vote for a cartoon character or leave a blind, line blank. I've been an election judge and I know that happens. Uh, neither Democrats nor Republicans own your vote, uh, nor can it be stolen. Uh, you have to earn it. In October of 2022, Rude participated in KSMQ's Candidate Forum, a roundtable discussion on current issues. Rude pushed the issue of cannabis legalization, along with a few other points of libertarian interest. So the first thing that I wanted, would want to do is reassert uh, Minnesota sovereignty as specified in the Tenth Amendment to legalize uh, natural unprocessed substances like marijuana and cot. On other topics, Rude was sometimes candid about his lack of study. Is there enough transit and, and affordable housing? Uh, I haven't really paid much attention to, to that issue. Uh, uh, it, it appears to me that you know we don't have a lot of people sleeping on the sidewalk in, in, in Rochester. Um, but I know that there are some people who are challenged with housing and they, they need to get help. And uh, I think we're providing some help in that direction too. But I think around the middle of last decade, around 2015, when we started talking about medical cannabis, um, it became clear that the DFL was a party that was looking to legalize that substance. And the other major party was um, a real big barrier in doing that, uh, which I think bared out this last legislative session. So I think the grassroots party or the legalized cannabis party after that point in time really just hindered in many smaller areas where they ran candidates uh, hindered the DFL being able to have more control, which would have actually led to legalization as we now see it would have. Also included in the work session was a raise in the percentage of votes to qualify independent parties for ballot status from 5% to 8% of the total vote. This reaction upset many pro-independents who felt their voices would be silenced. I was on the election committee. I was there when uh, Jesse Ventura came in and he was very upset. And uh, he says it like he sees it. If these rules would have been in place back in 1998, the state of Minnesota would not have had a chance to elect Governor Jesse Ventura. Now, I'm sure that pleases both of the parties because I believe that's why this is being done, so that there can never be another Governor Jesse Ventura the people of Minnesota won't be able to shock the world again. We won't be on the cover of Time Magazine and Newsweek for an election when I shock the world. Because guess what? If this rule would have been in place, I couldn't have won. I have been a, um, a proponent of more voices rather than less. 
So making it more difficult for other parties or other, um, organiza other political organizations to be a part of that, I think is, is detrimental. Uh, I remember that was all of us that were on the election committee as Republicans voted no and all the Democrats voted yes. And I had a, uh, one of the Democrat senators sitting beside me and I chatted with him a little bit and it was an interesting conversation and I'm not going to reveal it, but it was interesting to hear his thoughts because he, he was hesitant. He didn't know if he really liked it either. We saw with some of the legalized um, cannabis parties in the last couple of years that, that it has become a sort of political tool of one of the major parties to hurt the other party, to steal votes. Um, and I think both political parties hate when that's done to them, but maybe like the advantage that it gives them. And so I think making that harder, 8% is a very high percentage of people, um, or amount of vote to get, uh, I think is, is helpful to keep that from happening from either party. With the sudden implementation of the new law, many have concerns about public safety, especially when it comes to driving under the influence of THC. Others don't feel it will significantly change the safety landscape, and that alcohol still represents the greatest risk to our roads and highways. What kind of impact do you think this legislation could have on driver safety in Minnesota? Well, that remains to be seen, but I know that, again, the law enforcement is very concerned about it. I'm concerned because that's, as a legislator, that is part of our job to protect. No one in our society should want to cross a driver going 60 miles an hour on 218 who's under the influence of gummies. Driving under the influence, again, because we live in a free society is always going to be a problem. We don't want people to um, drive impaired. That said, the legalization of cannabis, uh, adult use cannabis, doesn't change the law at all with reference to driving under the influence. Um, it's illegal with alcohol, it's illegal with um, certain prescription drugs, and it's illegal with uh, cannabis. Some of the cases that they're pulling people over where they look like they're impaired is because of drug use. It's not necessarily because of alcohol, but they don't have tools to be able to, to do that. So this bill does allow money to go towards um, creating that technology and actually making sure that technology continues. Um, which would you consider a more harmful substance to society, families, and individuals, alcohol or marijuana? Oh, alcohol, I think, by a, by a large stretch, both in it, the abuses of it as well as, um, you know, over time to your liver and those sort of things, I think absolutely. If we look at the numbers without sort of bias, it has to be alcohol. I think it's good for Minnesota, actually, because Everybody was already doing it to an extent. And now that it's legalized, it's gonna take a lot of focus off of the weed smokers and the police officers. They can focus their attention somewhere else. Um, I guess I would say I probably have the same concerns I have about my children using cannabis that I do about alcohol and tobacco and vaping and all of those other substances. You know, I want to make sure that they're safe from all of those things. So as a parent, we've already been having a lot of conversations about, you know, staying chemical free. Me personally, I, I probably wouldn't want them to experience it. But then again, I can't say they can't because I've done it myself. Um, but I do think we recognize that something that we are used to being legal, like alcohol, uh, is more dangerous than something that we are used to being illegal, like cannabis. With marijuana, and THC products, although it's existed in some form, we haven't necessarily seen or faced it in widespread usage. And so that's a difficult question to answer. I don't think we'll have an answer for that until we see it uh, used and available in the same way that alcohol is. You know, when it comes to my daughter growing up, I believe in being very open and honest with her. Um, and if it's something that she's interested in trying, I would rather have a hand in it and know that it's legal, know that it came from a legitimate source, um, than, you know, her just buying it off the street corner. Would you be okay with her trying it? Um, if she wanted to try it with me supervising, I would be fine with it, yeah. Until they're 25, there's that development that could be harmful. So I think it has the more uh, downside probably with marijuana because there's a lot of unknowns. But alcohol has its problems too. And if anything that's abused is a problem. Our son suffered with mental health challenges that worsened as he grew. His struggles worsened and they got harder in middle school. By high school, he was using marijuana. 
His mental health episodes got dramatically worse then, and his academic performance slid sharply. Jay was suffering from borderline personality disorder. It is common for BPT people, or BPD, to self-medicate in their attempt to cope. Our son used a variety of cannabis products to do that. The effects on him were devastating. They did not help him. That led him to try a variety of other narcotics. On June 3rd, 2019, one laced with fentanyl took his life. He was one of multiple such emergency calls that night in our city. Each parent has a responsibility to teach and coach their children to um, how to use it properly. Um, if they are taught and exposed um, into the benefits and how to use it correctly, then they'll, they'll learn and, and they'll make wise decisions. If it's hidden from them and not shown or not talked about, then maybe they can get in trouble later on trying to try it or expose, be exposed to it. The, the substance does slow reaction time and, and has, again, some uh, impacts on people's ability to make quick decisions and, and their coordination. So whenever somebody's behind the wheel, if any of those abilities to make quick decisions and react and your coordination is off, that creates risk. And there are so many things that we have legal that are dangerous. Smoking tobacco kills thousands of people every day. Drinking alcohol and then driving drunk kills thousands of people every single day. Dr driving drunk kills other people who weren't, dr who weren't even drinking. People who were drinking um, habitually and now have liver disease. These, these are harmful substances that are legal. And so as I look at, at marijuana, um, definitely not something I want to be doing myself. And definitely we should not be asking or we should not be allowing people to abuse it. But it is something that when you think about it, we have to have a reason to make something illegal. And um, this was something that didn't make sense as you compare it to tobacco and alcohol. Medical use cannabis has been available in Minnesota since 2014. While there are many medical marijuana users who testify to its healing properties for certain physical and psychological conditions, there are also those voices who still doubt its usefulness as a medicine. This is a recreational bill, but for so long we've heard about medicinal, medicinal, which seemed to be a, a door to try to open it. And I think, again, in the end, or is, is it truly medicinal or is it going to be a substance like alcohol? Society enjoys it for its recreational benefits, but I think saying or using, again, some of these more potent forms of THC as a medicine um, for folks who might be struggling, especially if it's to um, treat psychiatric disorders already, I, I would just have a lot of concern about it. I have tried probably every biologic prescription medication that my provider has offered and how those medications work is they're effective for a while and then you build up a tolerance to the med and eventually they just stop working so they stop managing symptoms and they also carry very debilitating side effects. Does cannabis ever build a tolerance and stop working for you or does it ever have a, a side effect that um, you'd consider negative? Probably the only negative one for me is if I use a little bit too much THC to manage my pain I can get some paranoia, maybe a little increased anxiety. I haven't noticed that at all as far as a tolerance. I. Um, I've had a lot of intestine removed over the years, so luckily I'm pretty, I can use a small amount of edibles to manage my pain. From 63 years of observation, I see that there is no good thing that comes from marijuana except for the pain relief in some medical situations. I'm 100% for medical usage of marijuana, but not for recreational. It takes away a person's natural inclination to succeed. They become lethargic, apathetic, and basically an unproductive leech on society. Do you feel there's a stigma attached to your treatment choices? And has anyone ever suggested that you're a stoner? 
100%. I actually have had some people that were very close to me, that I thought loved me, call me a drug addict. Um, I've had a healthcare provider tell me that cannabis is highly addictive. She's no longer my provider. And I think there is. You know, stoner, druggy, worthless. Because of my disease, I eat once a day. In the evening, I use my cannabis about 30 minutes before I'm going to have a meal or food or a snack. I never drive after using that medication because I respect people too much for that. In my experience, I've worked with individuals that will talk about using marijuana to help them manage their anxiety and to help them sleep. But what they don't realize is that a few of the key symptoms of marijuana withdrawal or for individuals that use regularly in high, high doses is increased anxiety, increased irritability. They were just trying to figure out something to tame me and I was part of the Adderall generation, like give me Adderall. But then by the time I was in 10th grade, I realized that I don't want that in my body and I started smoking marijuana and that kind of helped me focus. Does your insurance cover your cannabis? Not a dime. It's expensive. And there's a lot of people that miss out because of it. Many have long considered marijuana to be a stepping stone to more illicit and dangerous drugs, like heroin and fentanyl. Proponents disagree. Some even say marijuana is a safe alternative to hard drugs, or even a safe treatment option for addiction. The research doesn't really show that marijuana use will lead to opiate use. There's not a, there's not a definitive connection between those. Certainly there's a correlation and a relationship that exists. Individuals that have used opiates or other types of drugs have oftentimes engaged in marijuana use as well, but not everybody that engages in marijuana use is going to engage in opiate use. Do you think the kids that use marijuana are more likely to end up using opiates or other hard drugs? I know that's a fact. I've seen it firsthand in numerous situations. Certainly alcohol and alcohol use does not necessarily open one up to the use of other drugs and so with, with THC I don't think it will be necessarily a, a causation uh, but again in either of those cases sometimes people make decisions that are not in their best interest when using other substances and when you have some drugs like our opiates that can develop addiction very quickly it certainly heightens the risk probably. I also watched the destruction of THC cannabis with my own nephew. And when he got hooked on cannabis, he kept going. He kept going. And he tried harder and harder drugs to the point that my sister and brother-in-law had to go down to Hennepin Avenue, buy drugs from a dealer to put Nicholas, who at the time was about 18 years of age, on a plane and get him out of Minnesota to a treatment program out in California. It's not so much that the marijuana led them here, it's that they have unresolved emotional pain, trauma, experiences that haven't been dealt with still and now what they were using to self-medicate or to try and escape or numb themselves from that is no longer working and so they need to find something else and as long as that problem exists there will always be that next step to something heavier for some of those individuals because they will continue to try and find ways to escape or numb that pain. Do you see many marijuana users seeking emergency medical assistance for overdose? For marijuana specifically? No. Um, you know, in my experience with marijuana, the, the risk for overdose isn't as significant as you see with other uses. Oftentimes, if somebody's experiencing some level of, of substance overdose. It's not solely related to marijuana. There have been other substances that have been involved in the process that are more impactful in that overdose than what the marijuana has been. While the new law allows for possession of marijuana, it does not allow for new retail licensing until 2025. However, existing medical marijuana companies, of which there are only two in Minnesota, will be allowed to sell from their dispensaries. I think that's uh, harmful because how they define cannabis business is really full orbed. Not just retail spaces, as you mentioned, but also growers, cultivators, event planners can't get 
uh, right now under that ordinance any sort of license until the last possible minute. And so in my view, what that will turn out to be is that those established businesses and larger cannabis businesses, big cannabis we might call them, uh, are going to have an insurmountable advantage as this new market opens up, which as I already discussed with you is contrary to what we wanted to do with this uh, uh uh, legislation to make sure that those communities, communities of color, lower class communities, entrepreneurs had a chance in this area before big business got its claws into it. And I think the Rochester City Council, uh, whether from a, uh, you know, maybe old school view of cannabis and wanting to delay things as long as possible uh, to a, a, a lack of foresight, um, I think really hurt the chances of smaller businesses here that are currently existing. Uh, I, I know several business owners that right now they're doing the small dosage gummies um, and now they'll be far behind places that currently have, for example, medical cannabis licenses. They'll be able to go as soon as that happens. By delaying cannabis business startups in Rochester, you are forcing our community members to establish their businesses outside of Rochester and to shop outside of Rochester, which will economically hurt the newly formed small cannabis businesses in our community. They deserve to be in the industry. Some small CBD shops and local cannabis farmers feel this provision gives these corporations an unfair advantage in the marketplace. You know, really, we, we learned uh, that a lot of these large corporations, uh, out-of-state corporations, um, really wield a lot of power, and uh, along with the unions that uh, they employ, or the, you know, um, and they have a big role in shaping legislation, uh, which isn't necessarily good for the small business people, and uh, not necessarily good for the consumer either. Another concern about delaying sales licensure until 2025, while at the same time legalizing marijuana, is the black market's potential to fill that gap. Honestly, tried and true in every other state where they've added uh, various additional taxes, you know, quote unquote sin tax, uh, to the products, and uh, you know you're competing with elements uh, in the market that don't have any taxation, uh, don't pay any rent, you know, yeah. so, um, or any other types of expenses. And, uh, you know, obviously they aren't deducting things, but, you know, if you're not paying taxes, uh, you don't need deduction. How much marijuana were you charged with possessing? Uh, a thousand kilos, 2,200 pounds, and I was given leader organizer for my crime. I was sentenced to 135 months in federal prison when I was 21 years old. Where, where was all this marijuana? It was in a truck coming back. From, there was 700 pounds caught in a truck coming back from California, and the driver immediately implicated me because I had sent him out there. I was guilty. Throughout this process of creating this documentary, I've heard a lot of opinions, a lot of voices. What would you say to those who suggest that you knew full well what you're doing was a crime, and that you chose to amass wealth through untaxed income for years, and that's just the chance you took, and that's, that's, that's justice served. What would you say to that? There's some truth in that, I would say, but the problem is, is our marijuana laws reflect our thinking from 1960s. So if we had sensible sentences at least, and reevaluate all the marijuana sentences, I wouldn't have done eight years, I maybe done two years and then my life wouldn't, would have been easy, easier to deal with, you know, and move sure. on. So there's an argument there, but I think that for sure all marijuana sentences need to be reevaluated with current thinking that it's medicine and people need it. But 2000 to 2004, you could sell a pound of high-grade marijuana for $4,000. And now a pound of high-grade marijuana on the streets in Minneapolis, this is all Minneapolis, everything happened in Minneapolis, I got arrested in Minneapolis, is $1,400. While some low-level misdemeanor marijuana crimes were designated to automatically erase from records August 1st, 2023, there are still people in prison for higher marijuana crimes related to dealing. Multiple studies have demonstrated that both nationally and in Minnesota, there is a racial component associated with arrest and incarceration for marijuana-related crimes. According to a story from KTTC in June, 
white and black Minnesotans use marijuana at approximately the same rate. Yet under legacy laws, a black Minnesota was around four or five times more likely to be arrested and prosecuted. Assuming this is true, why do you suppose that is? Well, my first question too would be back is that the state of Minnesota, the whole state, so greater Minnesota is where I represent, so it, it, I don't know if that's the same here. Um, so I guess my first thought would be, um, you know, the family, breakdown of the family, it'd be one, you know, those that uh, are in prison, um, a lot of times are the dads and, and uh, the sons kind of follow that same track. So I think that's part of it, not having a father in the home. And then also with the mom working the single parent home, I think that's difficult too on the family. Cause I know when I came home and probably when you came home, actually mom was home. Um, and I know people run right away to, to the law enforcement and uh, you know, I'm sure there's some of that. I don't know that I could speak necessarily to why it would be different other than just general racial disparity that we see, you know, nationwide. It's not even just locally or statewide. You know, there are, there's research that shows that people of color are arrested and convicted at rates higher than people that are white. And I don't think that that's exclusive to substances. Um, and so I think it's a continuation of a trend that we've known exists and, you know, that there's work to be done on that. If everybody's in prison based on legacy marijuana laws, that's breaking down the family. So it's wouldn't you agree that maybe that's hurting more than helping? Uh, obviously, if there is a, um, you know, I don't really know on that part. But yeah, if, if there is racial disparities on the laws, yeah, I'm actually against, uh, absolutely I'm against that. But I haven't done uh, a lot of study on it. And I know sometimes we can just run to, hey, it's just this. There's multiple reasons why. And to put the the finger on just one. I don't think it's just one. I think it's multiple ones. I think the the structural racism that has been involved in our justice system really since the start. I mean, our I think if we're honest about our country, I love the United States of America, but we certainly have a lot of wrongs that we have done. And probably the most prominent one is slavery for centuries. That's how we built our wealth. That's how we built our prestige. That's how we pushed westward. Um, and uh, I think it is foolish to now look at our current society and think that that had nothing to do with it, um, our, our racist past. And so I think we still see um, the repercussions of that today. And one of those is on the justice system, particularly around the war on drugs, where we know that people of color, particularly black uh, men, have suffered much higher rates of incarceration. Um, and as you said, it's not because of higher rates of usage. Um, it's because of how the Justice Department treats those people versus, for example, someone like myself, uh, who if I were, you know, caught illegally smoking marijuana, I probably maybe would get pro probation, maybe I wouldn't even get charged. Um, and it's just unfortunately uh, a reflection of our society and we're continuing to try to become better, but we do have to look at the reality of that situation, as you said. When somebody's facing jail time, serving jail time, they've been arrested for something that creates a lot of stress for an individual. And for them to have some relief from that, I think could certainly be some positive benefits in, in uh, being able to move forward with their lives. If we're going to legalize a substance, people should not be in jail or prison, or even if they are not incarcerated, um, not be able to get a job or you know, fill out an application for an apartment complex because of doing something previously that we now as a society say is legal. Certainly when it, when it was not legal, I think our agency and other agencies uh, around the state implemented and enforced what we had been asked to do. And I don't necessarily think expungement uh, undercuts that, but it is the will of the people as represented by the state legislature and we, will, um, we certainly understand that or I certainly understand that. And, uh, we will do as directed going forward as I'm sure the judicial branch and uh, the county attorneys will as well. How long were you in prison for cannabis related crimes? I was in federal prison from age 21 to 29, so eight years, 2004 to 2012, the, the end of 2012. Um, have your charges been expunged? 
No, they haven't, and there's uh, no conversation about that. I have a federal felony, so I need the president. You know, I went big, so I need the president to expunge me. You have someone who was not able or willing to follow the previous rules. Uh, whether or not that necessarily means they will do so going forward, I think again, uh, you know, making a determination on, on on how to move forward would have been better done um, with with an even keel and and giving preference to those who maybe have been involved and invested in this in the the process already and have been doing it. Uh, in a legal and proper manner prior to these changes. Freedom Grow is an organization that Randy Lanier is the vice president of. He has a sports docu-series, uh, Need for Weed, the second one. He did 26 years in prison for marijuana charges before he was finally pardoned. And we help these inmates like Valerie Flores that's currently serving 10 years in Waseca prison for marijuana charges. And there's so many more, but this is just one of the most outrageous ones that she's doing that. And we help them while they're doing their prison time. We deal with their families, buy their kids school clothes, and it's a national organization from California, and uh, me and we do the Minnesota end of it. Well, let's put some misconceptions to bed. Number one, currently right now we have about 8,000 people in jail. 40 of them are in jail because of marijuana use. So it's not like this is an epidemic. It's, it's, it's one of the biggest tragedies in America right now, what's going on, that there's selective few making millions of dollars off this, and then there's another selective few that are in prison, rotting away. It's just something needs to be done. We, in Minnesota, we don't put a lot of people in jail simply because of drug use. And this is something that I want to be incredibly crystal about. We do not want to be putting people in jail because of addiction. That is not where people belong. People don't belong in jail because they are addicted to a drug. They need to be in treatment. I think it's absolutely disgusting that we have a Minnesota representative putting pictures of himself doing drugs on his Facebook feed for children to see. Any regrets about the photo you posted on social media oh. of, of you using cannabis in Washington? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, I, one of the big things around this cannabis discuss, discussion is the huge amount of uh, stigma that people still have with it, that it is a, a party drug or like that just high schoolers do it, you know, and it's illegal. And really at the end of the day, it's just a substance like alcohol that a lot of people use to relax or a communal thing. Um, some people use it to, uh, you know, help with uh, headaches or migraines. I mean, there's a wide usage of it. And just as there's going to be, uh, no one said anything when I have posted pictures of me, you know, toasting with a beer or something when we win something. I don't think that should be the case here. So if I took some heat there, but maybe that means the next politician or next public figure that has that takes less heat, I'm okay with that. Well, here we are it's back outside the KSMQ Broadcast Center. And uh, we're visiting with Jeff Brinkman of Superior Cannabis. And Jeff's gonna tell us a little bit about Audrey here and uh, what, what kind of a role she has uh, in society now that marijuana is legal. We don't know if, uh, if this is a legal plant. Uh, we don't know what the difference is between cannabis and marijuana and CBD. Could you tell us a little bit about that, Jeff? I think this is the best uh, part of the whole thing. Um, Audrey, which is a male, uh, you'll see she's got her uh, pollen sacks uh, full and ready to go. So she's ready, or he's ready to actually pollinate female plants. And uh, uh, really interesting, uh, uh, completely legal plant. It's uh, growing wild in a uh, basically a, a beautiful little spot that's uh, of landscaping. Uh, it's been fertilized by basically uh, uh, mulch and uh, really has prospered. So it tells you a little bit about how uh, productive these plants can be, you know, in the wild. So is this marijuana or is this hemp or what's the difference? Uh, this would likely be uh, wild hemp. Um, difference is, uh, you know, this is, I'm, I'm guessing, but it's likely a ruderalis or similar. Um, all hemp uh, generally in North America is going to be from somewhere else it's it's an asian plant mm. but at some way in some way shape or form it found its way in this uh landscaping you know plot in the center of town and uh and took off it's uh, really a, a beautiful 
specimen of a male hemp plant. What would this plant be useful for? Um, this may, it's kind of tough. Uh, the genetics really uh, kind of determine, you know, whether it's a good fiber or a good seed um, uh, producing plants uh, or if it's a good cannab uh, cannabinoid producing plant. So could it possibly have medicinal qualities? It may. Uh, some of them even have medicinal qualities. Uh, they u utilize uh, um, in several countries the leaves and the roots in certain medicinal teas mm -hmm. um, and of course they use uh, stalks and uh, uh, you know stalks for fiber obviously and other products um, and then uh, generally uh, seeds used for uh, as a food product it's a high protein you know uh, um, all vegan uh, food source so it's got lots of potential here excellent um so what is the difference between, what is CBD, THC, mm -hmm. hemp? What are all these terms, marijuana? What, what, what are the differences? So all things are cannabis. Hemp, hemp is cannabis. Okay. Marijuana is cannabis. They're the same plant. They basically have an inverse relationship in their cannabinoid, their THC to say CBD um, contents. Um, so generally when it's got a high CBD or CBG ratio, those types of cannabinoids, medicinal cannabinoids, non-intoxicating, uh, they'll have a low THC concentration. Uh, in marijuana, you know, they'll have the inverse. They'll have a high THC concentration and then the lower minor cannabinoids, lower number of minor cannabinoids. Okay. Um, and this, we assume, is, is growing wild here. Is this a legal plant? Uh, well, it's Mother Nature can't be illegal, can she? <laughs> so, so to me, uh, it would be completely illegal. Uh, it wasn't planted by anybody, so uh, basically it self-germinated and took off in the middle of town. Yeah, I don't know if you guys can see this, but uh, I'll tap it a little bit. Is it visible? Yeah. I see stuff falling, white specks. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's, dropping, uh, it's dropping pollen right now. So it's, it's looking for female plants to pollinate. But yeah, these can actually, in a light breeze, this can travel for miles, miles. So you mentioned that if, if you carry some of that back to your plants, it's, it could affect them. Yeah, I would clean. I'm basically probably going to shower before I go back to my farm. Interesting. Because even, you know, brushing up against them, um, or leaving anything behind. I mean, it's just like dust or powder. Uh, it's about like, almost like powdered sugar in a way, even maybe a little more fine. Wow. So it can, but it floats. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Well, now that we know uh, Audrey's actually a male, <laughs> <laughs> can you tell me what kind of a specimen do you think Audrey is as a uh, plant? She's beautiful. She's, uh, uh, well, he, he, Audrey is, uh, must be 10 to 12 feet tall. Um, so, you know, even our plants are, ours are a little short and bushy, so ours are about three to four feet. They usually finish out about six feet. So this is about double the height of, uh, you know, our homegrown plants. Don't Audrey's, tell anybody. <laughs> Audrey's a healthy <laughs> specimen. Very healthy, All very right. healthy. Thank you so much, Jeff. You I betcha. appreciate you coming out today. Yes, yeah, great meeting you. On August 1st, 2023, marijuana became legal to possess and use in Minnesota. Many proponents, vendors, and musicians gathered at First Avenue in Minneapolis for a lively celebration simply called Legalized It. Outside, there was a section of 7th Street closed to traffic and designated for legal marijuana smokers to assemble and socialize. Predictably, a thick haze of pungent smoke lingered in the heavy August air over the enthusiastic but tame urban crowd. The atmosphere was jubilant. We wanted to have a place for people to safely consume their cannabis and closing down a street, downtown Minneapolis is the perfect place to do it. Have you had any problems so far? Everything's been running smooth, people are super respectful, people are excited, no problems on my end. Have you been hitting the cannabis yet today? A little bit. Yes, we did just now, actually. <laughs> really? Yeah. I mean, we just ended so many decades of prohibition where people, especially people of color, low-income communities, were disproportionately targeted. And this is just a massive moment in Minnesota history where we can end prohibition and people can safely consume cannabis. What does uh, the legalization of cannabis mean to you personally? Well, I think the legalization of cannabis is just a small step in um, 
in what should actually happen in terms of like legislation to go through for criminal justice reform. So it's really, it's great that we can all be here celebrating today, but we have to get back to work tomorrow and we have so much more work to do too. Have you been using cannabis today? Not yet. I'm going to wait till my news interviews are over before I can celebrate. <laughs> Inside the venue, the stage featured a host of diverse musicians from rap to reggae to rock, with one common message, the celebration of marijuana legalization. The story you have just seen is true. Audrey's name has not been changed despite the fact that she's actually a male cannabis plant. At the end of summer, to prevent the growth of more plants in spring and to reduce counterproductive conversations around the water cooler, the decision was made to retire Audrey to an undisclosed location. KSMQ will remember Audrey mostly for his sweet disposition and his capacity to roll with the ever-changing times. And of course, his unique ability to make cannabis connections. This program sponsored in part by Austin Windshield Plus, your local windshield experts. Speedy Insurance approved auto glass replacement or repair. Mobile or in-shop quality service, 100% satisfaction guaranteed.